right. Welcome to class. Um, good to see you back from spring break. I hope you had a good break. Rested up or had fun or caught up on work or whatever it was. I think uh, I hope it was good. So today we're going to co cover a, a few different ways of doing layouts. One of the things I think I mentioned before is the idea of responsive design. Yes, I did week eight. Uh, responsive design is the idea is with responsive design. We're going to make the page shape itself and adjust the way it looks depending on the size of the screen. For example, in this video here, notice how the image actually gets smaller as the, as the screen gets smaller. That way you don't have to do sideways scrolling. A, a general rule on web design is that vertical scrolling is okay. Side scrolling is not okay. So you want to avoid having the image being so big that it would get cut off and you'd have to scroll to the side to see it. So this becomes especially important when we start talking about developing websites that work well on a mobile device. So we're going to cover a couple of things today that are that are particularly effective in responsive design. Uh, and uh, we'll cover some of the principles there. So. Let's look. One of them is CSS grid layouts. And there's a couple of tutorials I have here. I have this tutorial and I have tutorial. So spend some time reviewing these tutorials. Essentially, with the idea of a grid, a grid is something where you have rows and columns. That's usually what we mean when we talk about a grid with respect to design. And a lot of graphic design is based on grids. We can search up grid and design here see what we get. All right, here's an example of a grid. All right, this might be a list of uh, pages that you could go to, for example, on a website. But they're aligned in rows and columns. There's four rows and four columns here. Grids can be a little bit less regular than that. Uh, for example, if we look at this one, we see all different kinds of grids. This grid, for example, notice that one row consists of one column and these other, this other row consists of kind of hard to see because of the lightness of the color, but this looks like there is two columns in this row. Or this one, one row is one column and then the other two, uh, the other row is three columns. So anytime you have rows and columns, or you can think of it as rows and columns, you're thinking of it as a grid. So I'm gonna go over a very simple example. And again, you're encouraged to go through the tutorials and learn a little bit more about that. We'll go through some of the examples on in the tutorials as well once we finish looking at uh, my example. All right, so let me download this. Here is a grid layout. And in this, it's, uh, I think we have a different example. We've gone away from the travel uh, example and have gotten to a Star Wars example, I think. 
but I have a page that looks like this. And this is a grid, as you can see. It has rows and columns. This is a row that extends over three columns. This is a column that extends over three row, rows. And each of these columns then finish out the rows. And in this one, well, we only have two because we're, we're missing a, a section. And then we have the footer down on the bottom of the page. All right, so we're going to look at the styling that creates this. Notice that it is responsive. As this gets wider and narrower, page gets, or the content gets wider and narrower. So let's look at the CSS that does this, and let's look at the HTML that does this. We also have this, which is a different kind of grid, which is really similar to the kind of grid that we had in one of our earlier methods that we, we used. We created a design that looks like this. Well, we'll start out looking at this one and then go to the second one. You should pretty well know what to expect as far as the HTML goes. We have our basic sections of the page. We have our header, we have our nav, we have our footer, uh, and we have a section that contains content. Except for one thing that's different. Notice we have header, nav, we have a bunch of sections, and then we have a footer. One difference though is we have a div, and a div is simply a division I could have just as well put a section here, but mostly many of the examples use a div. It has an ID of wrapper. It's, it's a wrapper because it goes around all the stuff that's on the page. When you have something like that that goes around a few things to just group them together so that you can treat them as a unit, a lot of times the terminology of that would be a wrapper. And again, that wrapper goes around all the content in the entire page. That's going to be useful when we get to the grid layout. All right, let's look at the CSS that accomplishes this. All right, this should be no surprise, body, background, URL color black, font Helvetica, and so on. Now, notice we have a style on the wrapper. The wrapper is going to be our entire grid. The whole ball of wax here, the grid. So I said the display of the wrapper is grid. I'm telling the browser that everything in this wrapper is considered to be part of a grid. And the gap between the items in the grid is 10 pixels. And the minimum width is 600 pixels. So no matter how big or small I make this, it's not gonna get smaller than 600 pixels. Notice there it's right at 600, doesn't get any smaller. And I say the grid template columns are 20%, 30%, and 30%. That means that there's going to be three columns in this grid, which there are. One, two, three. Now you might look at this and say, well, this doesn't have three columns. And we're going to see in a minute here how you're able to add columns or, or combine columns rather uh, together into uh, a single column. So we got this. By default, 20%, 30%, 30%. That adds up to 80% of the page. Again, a lot of times we don't make it to exactly 100% because when you add padding and in the grid gap and other things there, it actually turns out to be bigger than uh, the width of the screen if you made it at 100%. So, like, if we did this as 
40, 40%, 40%, 20%. With that grid gap in here, it's gonna be slightly bigger. And remember, we don't really want to have a, a horizontal scroll bar. But we could maybe make it a little bigger. We can make them 35%, we should be okay. All right. Okay. So that's what this is saying. The wrapper, the thing that goes around everything is gonna be a grid. It's gonna be treated as having rows and columns. And by default, it's gonna have three columns. This is their widths. And here's some other attributes. Now, the header, as you notice, the header goes over across the entire grid. I'm going to just for, for fun, put a border around the entire grid. Or you can see I'll make it bigger than two pixels, make it 10 pixels. Really stands out. Okay, there's a 10 pixel border that goes all the way around everything. And the grid inside of it is 20, 30, and 30. Now, the header, background is white, opacity is 0.9, which means that it is not quite solid. If you look here, you can see the little bit of the yellow text underneath the header that spells out Star Wars. The bigger that we make that number, the more solid it's going to be. So if we made this one, going to be completely solid. Because you can't see any of the writing behind it. If we made this point one, it's very, very see-through. In fact, it's so see-through, you can't even really, if I look real closely, I can see it. I'm not sure if you can see it on the screen or not, but the word Star Wars reviews are there. Let's make it a little bit more solid, make it point, uh, point 0.2, which is like 20%. Still not really solid. Up to point 0.4. Uh, I saw you had a question. I'll look at it in a second it flashed pretty quickly. There we go. Uh, oh, we can see it. All right, excellent. Uh, but again, that number, the higher you make it, the more solid it is. The lower you make it, the less solid it is. We're going to turn it back to what it was originally, because I think that was a nice number, 0.9. All right, panning 10 pixels. What that means, again, to review is there's 10 pixels between the edge of this and the start of the text. The border is dotted, and it's yellow. And here we have the grid column start and the grid column end. This says how many columns this particular section, this particular piece of the page is going to cover. Now, this is a little confusing when I first learned it. Uh, and again, I don't know why they did it this way, but we want it to go from columns one to three. 
So we say the start column is one and the last column, the end column is four. We do one more than however many columns we wanted to go over. So if we wanted to go over the first two columns, we would make this three. And then it would go over the first two columns. But we wanted to go over the entire row. So we say, well, cover all four, all three columns. So go to go start at one and go until you hit four, even though we only have three columns. You can almost predict how the nav section is going to be. We do use a grid row start and a grid row end. So we start the row at column, uh, or we start the first row of this navigation is two. The last row is five, or the ending row is five, which means this covers row two, three, and four. So if you're drawing a wireframe, and you had a page that looked like this, let's say this was our wireframe, this header would have a column start at one to four, because there's three columns. So it starts at one, it ends at the start of four. This would have a, this would just be a regular cell. This would cover two rows. So it would start at, whoops, start at row two and go to four. And this would go, this would also start at two and go to four rows. Whereas these wouldn't have any, and they would just be a one by one, one column, one row. So if you can draw it, you can figure out how many rows and columns each section spans and come up with those numbers on your own. Footer, we want to start it at column at row five, and it has starts in our column one and goes through the beginning of column four. We can put these things to overlap if we wanted to. What if we put this at four? Didn't overlap. Oh, it, it got really confusing at that point. Huh. That really screwed up the, the. What if I omit this? I bet this is the same as putting it in. I thought so. But if we play around with these numbers to make them different, you might get something a lot different than you expected. That's basically it for the grid layout. Again, to review, we put a wrapper around everything and we say the display type is grid. We can specify the gap between the grid. We can specify how wide the columns are. Says we have three columns with these percentages. We then specify for each element 
start and end column. What if I got rid of all of these start and end columns? If we do that, it assumes everything takes up one row and one column. And it'll be just like a series of squares. Everything takes up only one column. Let's look at the tutorial for maybe some other things that I did not cover. I close the tutorials. I hit record, right? Yes. <laughs> first week, first week back after spring break, I'm double checking myself. And here's some examples. Or it shows you the, the thing and it shows you how you can possibly organize them. So this is basic to finding a grid, and there's the CSS. Again, we didn't put anything in box because the box, each box takes up one column and one row. This example, things are in a different order. So if we look at this, We specify the column start and the column row, and we can position those boxes any way we want to. A goal with CSS is to have an independence between the content of the page and how it appears. So, for example, in this case, we can actually make that grid appear in a different order than the HTML is. HTML box A is the first A. But with CSS, we can put box A starting at column two for one column and starting at row one for one column. So almost anything you can dream about, they show examples of here. Uh, in the other case, we have More about grid layout. Introduction. They've been calling the lines, cells, grid track. Grid area, so on. And somewhere here, I thought there were some examples. Don't see any, but this contains a whole big listing of the properties. There's even some animation. That sounds interesting. Look it up. Nice. This requires a bit of JavaScript, which we will touch on later on in the semester. I want to go over one other example of a grid layout, and that was one that was close to a design that we had earlier in the semester, uh, a, week, a week or two before spring break. And that is this page. 
which again, if you recall, we did this kind of layout several different ways. Here's how we can do it with the grid layout and notice how, how easy this is. We have our basic HTML. As the wrapper again, has the header, nav, section and footer. And then let's see if we can figure out how this is going to go. This is going to have a starting and ending column. The start column is going to be one. The end column is going to be three. Neither of these are going to have a start and ending column, which means that they're one by one. This is going to have, oh, I love, no, that's right. That's right. And this one is also going to start in row uh, on column one and go to, to uh, column three. That's not to say that's not the proper CSS for this. This is the CSS that goes with it. Grid, we make a wrapper. Grid template columns are 20 and 70%. So notice that in our browser, this takes up 20% of the grid space. This takes up 70%. Header, column start one, column end three. Neither of these have a start and end, which means they just fall in place where they fall in place, and they take up one column and one row. And finally, the footer, as I said, starts in column one, ends in three. This is a lot simpler way of doing things than the other methods that we use to achieve this sort of design. So if this is your wireframe, I would use the grid to do that. All right. Um, the grid um, really simplifies things uh, as far as that goes. Why do I even bother going over the old stuff? Well, again, if you get a job working on a website, Someone may have done things in an older style. They may not have learned about the grid uh, method of CSS, and you might have to deal with changing code that someone else wrote. So it's kind of a necessity to go over the old, older ways of doing things. All right, we also have, these go hand in hand together, and I wouldn't say one of these is better than the other, but you can look and, and decide when to use each of these. You also have something called a flex box. This is similar to that, but it's even more flexible. two there is a grid here as well but once we get beyond a certain size this drops into one column which as i've said before is very useful when we move to uh mobile devices so let's look how this one is accomplished html is going to look very 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 similar if not identical yep Still has the wrapper, still has our sections. So we're going to focus on the style sheet. All right, the wrapper, we say the display is flex. So with the grid view, we said the grid uh, display was grid. And flex wrap means it will wrap things around. What that means is if there's not enough space to put things in, we'll wrap it to the next line. Exactly what we have here. When we get to a certain point, these things fit side by side. When it gets to be too small, it will drop it down to the next line. Very similar to the flow.
And that is all we have to do style wise, other than specifying the normal things that we specify for that. So we specify the width that we want of this. We specify the width we want of this. The width of this, we can specify a minimum width if we want. And so on. And the flex box sort of handles everything else for us. We could have written this using floats, but it would have been a lot more complicated. All we did in this case is to find that our wrapper contains a flex box. There are tutorials that cover this as well. And here is an example where we have a bunch of divs. And the flex, uh, the flex wrap is no wrap, which means that if this gets smaller, it never wraps it to the next line. So if that's the behavior you want, that's how you get it. So we defined our flex container and specify the display is flex. This, by the way, the syntax says that any div within something that has a class of flex container. So that would be all these divs here, but it wouldn't be another div if the div was outside of it. specify a direction of these things. Do you want them to be oriented horizontally or vertically? You can reverse things if you want. So you can put the row on top, the bottom row on top if you want. Now the flex wrap is the one I talked before. When it gets so small, if it won't fit, it wraps it to the next line. I think it's obvious how something like this is very beneficial for uh, responsive web design. If you want to develop something for a browser window and uh, also for a, a phone. You can imagine this being the way the window looks uh, on a browser. If each one of these was a little panel about a product that your company was selling. Maybe you're a clothing store and this was a this is pictures of all the sweaters that you have. Well, on the on a desktop device, it will spread out like this. On a mobile device, it'll spread out like this. Again, no horizontal scrolling, which is bad, but possibly vertical scrolling. Now, these techniques, the flex box and the grid, are fairly new techniques. However, most browsers should have them by now. There's a website you can use to check to see what browser has what features. And it is called Can I Use? So if I go to Can I Use? I can type in something up here and notice top two items, grid and flex box. Can I use CSS grid? And it will show me all the browsers that implement it. Both desktop browsers and mobile browsers. So Chrome, Google Chrome from 57 on which was released in 2017, which to me seems like a year or so ago, but in reality is about six years ago, all right? So you can be pretty safe to say most people are gonna have this browser that are using Chrome. Edge, again, from 2015 to 2017, it only sort of implemented it. But starting in 2017, in October, 
Edge implemented it. I guess uh, Safari started implementing it back in 2017 also. So 2017 seems a critical year of it. Now notice the Opera browser, which doesn't seem to be updated much, or they don't have the update history, uh, doesn't support it at all. The global usage of it is 0.99%. So there'd be a very small percentage of people that did not use that. How would it do it for that? It would probably just stack the sections on top of each other, just like the basic flow layout. Remember, when you're designing a page, your page doesn't have to look identical in each platform. It just has to work for each platform. The bottom line of this, the conclusion I would come to is that it's pretty safe to use a grid layout. All right. And I'll bet if we look at Flexbox, it will show me the same thing. Internet Explorer, which has even less percentage than Opera Mini, 0.49%, only sort of implements that. The rest of them starting in 2014 actually implement the flex box. If I was doing a website from scratch, chances are I would use either the grid or the flex box. They each have their own strengths and weaknesses. And we can Google to see. Grid versus flex box. There's a tutorial that talks about when to use them. Grid layout, when you have a complex design to work with and want maintainable web pages, you want to add gaps over the block elements. Flexbox, when you have a small design with a few rows and columns, you need to align the elements. You don't know what the content will look on the page and you want everything to fit in. I'm sure if we Google more of these, we could find other reasons. So if you're just trying to decide between the two, do some research and figure out which works better for you. However, this can I use is not just for Flexbox and, and uh, uh, Grid. Uh, we, can, we can Google, you know, any new feature uh, that may or may not. Uh, gap property for Flexbox. Yep, almost everything implements that. It's a nice thing to check. And then you can, if you, especially if you know uh, something about your customers, are they customers that typically would be updating their browsers or whatever, you can see kind of the percentage overall that would use a browser and make the decision. And again, keep in mind that just because something doesn't implement it doesn't mean not to use it at all. Because uh, these things would most likely just appear as blocks stacked on top of each other if you happen to use an ancient browser that did not implement those. All right, we have one more tool in our tool belt for creating responsive pages. And that is what's called a media query. And we'll look at this mobile example here. I'm surprised I didn't have a link for media queries, but you can certainly Google that to get more information. I actually give you two different versions. Here's one version. This is a page viewed on the desktop. All right, that Star Wars page. Now I can run this through an emulator if I use Google Chrome by going up to 
for tools, developer, developers tools, and I can select actually if I were to display this in, for example, a Samsung S8, this is how it would look at, look like. Notice how it looks radically different from the page. In fact, if we look closely, there's even a section missing. Let me bring up the same page in the Chrome browser, uh, uh, in the desktop version, so we can see these next to each other. All right, there is the there is this well, web page viewed in a uh, desktop browser. Here is the identical web page viewed in a mobile browser. In fact, if we simply make the screen smaller, it will go to this. Notice how the picture of R2D2 gets smaller as we make it smaller and bigger as we make it bigger. Notice how this section that said, here's another section, desktop only, magically disappears when we make it a certain size. So how do we do that? Well, let's look at our web page. HTML should be no secret, how it's been for the last couple examples. Only new thing that we have for this is we have a wrapper, just like we did before. And then we have our main CSS and a desktop CSS. Now, notice there is something tacked onto this desktop CSS that says only apply it if you're on a computer screen, what screen means, and the minimum width is at least 800 pixels. So that's the magic number where this actually gets smaller. This is bigger than 800 pixels, right about Here, we're at 800 pixels. So this says both these style sheets apply, but the second one only applies if this condition is true. So what we do is we have our basic design in main.css. Our basic mobile design, the design for the mobile page, the body having a background yellow, header, sections, all that. We have our basic design in main.css, and then we have the additions and the things that get overruled for the desktop design we have in the desktop. That CSS. So notice for the desktop CSS, we use a background image. We have the display of grid for this, and we specify the rows and columns. So in the basic design for the mobile, each of these elements is 90% of the screen. When this applies, we change that, we overrule it. So when you have style sheets like this, this gets applied, then this overrules anything that they have in common. So like if I were to switch these around, it wouldn't matter for the mobile view. That's gonna look the same, but the desktop view is gonna be screwed up. It's not gonna be the way we want it to be because it applies it this, and then this overrules. The second one overrules the first. So therefore, we usually do it in this order. We have our basic, how we want our mobile to look, and then we have a second style sheet of how we want the desktop to be different than the mobile. Now, we can do that another way. 
also using media queries, or we combine everything in one style sheet. Again, the effect is the same, but if we look at this example, Everything's in that main style sheet. That file is there, but we don't really use it. So I'm going to delete it. How do we accomplish this magic? We put the media queries right in the CSS. So here's my basic style sheet that everyone gets. Here is the things that apply when we're on a computer screen and it is at least 800 pixels wide. And then we put all the stuff that we want overruled in that. It doesn't matter which way you, you do it, both ways. I mean, I can, I can see doing it either way. This has the advantage of everything's in one style sheet. But we put the media query here, we wrap around all the style rules that appear all that, that apply only when we're on a computer screen that's at least 800 pixels wide. So we can literally get two pages, or, or I'm sorry, the same page to display two different ways for a computer and a mobile device. And that really is a good thing, as I think Martha Stewart used to say. That is a good thing because then we can make the page truly responsive to the device that we're seeing it in. And that's our goal. People that use mobile devices use use them for use search the web different ways than people that are on a desktop device. So maybe we want to hide some content. Maybe we have some additional detail on the desktop homepage that we want to hide. Oh, how do we do that? We have a class. In the wrong. In the wrong. Folder. We put the things that we want to hide in something with a class that says desktop only. We assign it a class. And by default, we make that invisible. And the style sheet that applies, if we're on a desktop machine, then changes the display from none to black. So that means on a mobile, when this applies, we don't see that content. On the desktop, when this overrules, we do see that content. And I did it with the, just that one section, but I could do it with a lot of other things. I could do it with a picture of R2D2 if I wanted to. I'm right opening the right page because I have a bunch of pages that all look the same. Instead of working on the wrong file, maybe I don't know.
I don't know why that's working. I'll bet you I'm working on the wrong file. But trust me, if you put that class on there, it should make it disappear. Um, all right, that's all I had for today. Coming up soon, if I'm not mistaken, is nice, nice example of responsive design, by the way. Notice how this is in one column when I'm on a when I when the window is narrower. And it's multi columns when it is on a wider screen. Uh, your project design is due March 29, which amazingly enough is less than two weeks from now, right? Because this Wednesday is the 22nd. And uh, so a week from that is that. So if you haven't started thinking about your semester project, please do so. Email me your ideas and I can help you out. Email me your rough draft. I can help you out to get it in ship shape. All right, if there are no further questions, uh, that's all I have for today. Have a good day. Uh, we might be seeing some of you in lab, might not be, but at any rate, we will see you next week.